I'm Elizabeth Stevenson, and I am the program officer and chair of the Marine Conservation Action Fund, which is a program of the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life at the New England Aquarium. How many of you have heard of the Marine Conservation Action Fund? Wonderful, wonderful. How many of you have been to uh, past lecture by one of our grantees or fellows? Terrific. All right, great to see so many familiar and supportive faces here here tonight. So. Um, so through MCAF, if you're not familiar with the program, we give micro-grants to conservation leaders around the world, such as John Flynn, who share the aquarium's commitment to ocean conservation. Working in developing countries, as you can imagine, is incredibly challenging, as John and his team do, facing many challenges, and yet there is so much need there to support conservation efforts and so few resources to do that. So that's where MCAF comes in. We, we provide support through financial, through grants, so financial support, we provide technical support through our scientists advising our grantees and fellows, and we provide professional support, networking, connections, um, moral support and guidance to our grantees and fellows. And MCAF is truly a global program. We have funded projects in 40 countries across six continents. Projects such as studying and protecting manatees in West Africa, identifying the last remaining sawfish populations in places such as Mozambique and Mexico, launching the first marine mammal stranding network in the country of Iran, and of course protecting sea turtles in Ghana. Each one of these projects is a story of hope for the ocean, and the people driving that hope are people like John and his team who are making a difference for the ocean and who need our support. One of the ways that we seek to support our grantees in a formalized way is through our fellows program, and that's what brings John to us here tonight. So we bring selected grantees to the aquarium, and these are our 10, our first class of fellows in what's been a three-year program supported by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. So these are our, our first class of 10 fellows. Um, and so each of them spends a week at the aquarium where they are fully immersed in our community. They share their work inspire our audiences to take action for the ocean, and hopefully take back with them additional knowledge, advice, and support, as well as a sense of appreciation for their work. So your being here tonight and showing an interest and appreciation in, in John Flynn's work in Ghana is, is a big piece of that, that he will take back with him and will hopefully further fuel his efforts. So during their week here, as an example with John Flynn, it's, a, it's an extremely busy and arduous week. John is almost at the end of his week here uh, tonight um, giving you this lecture. Um, we, we do things such as they exchange information with our Anderson Cabot Center scientists. So um, here he was talking about bycatch reduction with Tim Werner and um, Michelle Cho in our Anderson Cabot Center. We also have a fabulous visitor education team here who are trained, as you know, from visiting the aquarium and best practices and communication. And so we had a meeting where they all discussed like ways to interpret John's work and, and John shared story that, stories that, that they can then share on the floor of the aquarium when interpreting our exhibits. We also spend a lot of time inspiring the next generation of ocean protectors because that's a huge, um, that's sort of where, you know, the change is gonna come as we, as we, we can see in our young people. Um, so today, John spent two hours in the Blue Planet Action Center in our aquarium meeting with little kids. And you can see he's um, in the, the top left there, he's showing how little a sea turtle hatchling is. And in the bottom, he's showing how big a, a giant leatherback you know, can, can be. Um, so just kid after kid came up just fascinated with all the things he had to say about, about sea turtles. We also visit local schools with our fellows. So uh, yesterday, we went to the Amigo School in Cambridge, where John presented his work to the middle school students there. And here you can see him on, um, on the left. He's explaining how um, leatherback turtles are like Pac-Man, and that they go after the jellyfish. And that was a great uh, metaphor to use with the kids there. We also work to amplify the, elevate the profile of our fellows and amplify their, the message of their work. And so, um, our marketing and communications and media team you know, connect with uh, media outlets and, and try to raise the profile of, of our visiting fellows. And so one outcome of this was when um, John Flynn and I had the good fortune to be on the take last night with Sue O'Connell, where we were able to talk a little bit about MCAF as well as um, his sea turtle work in Ghana. So you can check it out if you want to find, find the link there. 
So none of this would be none of this would be possible without the support of many different institutions and um, people. Um, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, as I noticed, supports the Fellows Program um, along with individual donors. The New England Biolabs Foundation, who are here tonight, thank you so much for your support, supports the MCAP program. The Curtis Needed Munson Foundation, individual donors, some of you are here tonight, thank you so much for supporting this really important program and the work of people like John. Um, we also have a committee of scientists that volunteers their time, they're from all around the world to review our proposals so that we fund the projects with the most promise. The Lowell Institute who makes these lectures possible. Women Working for Oceans, who has been a great champion and supporter of MCAF. And of course, our grantees and fellows who are doing this great work around the world. So with that, I want to go ahead and introduce to you John Flynn, who has a, has a very uh, unique pathway to finding his way here tonight to you in, uh, in Boston. So, Coming from a background of marketing and graphic design, and later as a helicopter pilot, John spent the last seven years of his life building his experience throughout Africa, India, and Asia, and is now working with a team of local people he assembled in Ghana, West Africa, to protect endangered sea turtles since 2011. At that time, his home country, Ireland, was undergoing its own problems. The Celtic Tiger, a time of rapid economic expansion, had well and truly ended with a bang, and Ireland was suffering the worst economic recession it had ever experienced. With the advertising and design business in rapid decline, John decided enough was enough and that his talents could be better used protecting endangered marine wildlife now that he was fully aware of the threats it faced. Life has moved on for Ireland and for John, and the advertising and marketing world that was once so well known to him has now long since been forgotten, along with the helicopter flying. John has since attained a diploma in marine biology and gained experience in sea turtle conservation and rehabilitation working with biologists and conservationists in India, Greece, and Africa. In his lecture tonight, John will share how working in a challenging environment where at times things seem impossible, we are all capable of rising to the challenges that try to beat us down and also about the times when things go right and the treasured moments that make all the work worthwhile. It's been an extreme pleasure to spend the week here with John Flynn, so I'm going to turn the podium over to you. Please join me in welcoming um, him to the podium. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. And just like to say good evening to everybody. I know it's not exactly the nicest night outside, so thanks for making the effort and coming over. And hopefully you're all going to leave here knowing a little bit more about sea turtles and maybe one or two other things. Okay, one or two other things, yes. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a quick overview of the programme that we're actually running down in Ghana, which, as Elizabeth has mentioned, has been running since 2011. It's met with plenty of struggles, but it's also thankfully had lots of successes as well. Not everybody may know where Ghana is, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to actually take the overall map of Africa, and if we look, we can see on the left-hand side here, Ghana, Gulf of Guinea. So that's where Ghana is overall within Africa. And then where do we operate? We can see here Takaradi and Axiom. So a lot of our work takes place to the west of Takaradi, but we also work a little bit towards Cape Coast and also around um, just before Winneba as well. So there's an awful lot of things about sea turtles that are actually very interesting. We have to remember like they've been around a lot longer than us. We've been around maybe a million years. Sea turtles have been around 150 times that. So they have a long history and they know lots of stuff. All the species of sea turtles that we know of at the moment that remain, which is a total of seven species, they're all listed on the International Union for the Conservation of Nature red list, anywhere between like vulnerable to critically endangered. Now, vulnerable isn't something we need to worry too much about. It's more a flag marker of something we may need to worry about in the future. Critically endangered requires a lot of our attention because critically endangered means the next step is that they will go extinct in the wild and you'll only find them in either zoos or aquariums. So we want to take any creature that's critically endangered and bring it back from that and try and have more of them in the wild. So one of our jobs is to try and conserve populations that exist and then restore populations further so the oceans become healthier. There's a number of threats that sea turtles actually face and those threats are faced both on land and at sea. So we're going to have a look at some of those threats now. There's a couple of the pictures aren't really particularly nice, but they do show in the real world what the threats are. 
So here we have one sea turtle that actually got hit by a propeller of a boat. And as you can see, the front of the nose and also the shell got quite badly injured. Now, turtles are very resilient. And after 18 months, this turtle was actually pretty much fully healed and was able to be really released back to the ocean. It's funny because when you work with a turtle over a long period of time, while it doesn't seem obvious, they actually all have their own personalities. And this turtle loved people. Despite having suffered at the hands of people, it just loved coming up to the edge of its tank and pet me. You know, it was basically like an aquatic dog. <laughs> so another threat then that we have is um, fishing line and entanglements. So what we're looking at here is we're looking at a very small hawksbill sea turtle. And hawksbills are actually on the critically endangered list. So it's super important that we do whatever we can for a hawksbill. This little guy here had had a piece of fishing wire wrapped around his left hand shoulder. And what happens is in the water, as they keep moving their flippers, it has the effect of actually sawing into the skin. So what had happened, this turtle here, was that the actual blood flow had stopped going into the flipper, meaning that the, effectively the flipper was going necrotic. The only way that that turtle could be saved was to actually amputate the flipper before the gangrene went inside the shell, because once it goes inside the shell, there's nothing we can do. So you're thinking amputating a flipper, but isn't that really bad for a turtle? Well, thankfully, sea turtles are known to be quite adaptable, and they can go back to the ocean with only three flippers. If you have a turtle that's missing two flippers on one side, then it can't go back to the ocean. Or if it's missing two flippers, i.e. the two front or the two back, then it can't go back to the ocean. But even missing two flippers once they're opposing, the turtle will have a very good chance of survival back in the ocean. So when it comes to rehabilitation, we have to remember turtles aren't pets, they're wild animals. Our goal is to always try and get them back into the ocean and not keep them there as something that's kind of nice to look at and, you know, feel good about. The feel good really comes in actually seeing the turtles go back to the ocean. Other threats, I'm going to leave this one with you for a few minutes, we're going to come back to it. Most of you will probably be able to figure out what it is, but in a few minutes we're going to look at a different aspect of our programme, and then this is going to make perfect sense to you. Another threat, uh -huh. another threat that faces sea turtles is a loss of habitat, and that can come about by a variety of things. The most common thing is actually uh, sea levels rising, beach erosion, and also a lack of habitat caused by the fact that the just beaches are too dirty and the turtle can't find somewhere to nest. Now what will normally happen is when a turtle comes ashore, it'll make one or two attempts at digging a nest. If at that stage it's unsuccessful, it'll come back again the following day. If it comes back the second day and it's still unsuccessful, it'll actually go back to sea, it'll dump all of the eggs that it would have actually put into that nest, and it'll wait approximately between two and three weeks before coming back in with another set of new eggs and attempting to lay those. So you can see as a very simple example what we have done here, we've taken a section of beach, we've got some of the guys out, we've spent a couple of hours, and we've taken an area that the turtles can't use into being perfectly usable nesting habitat once again. In its own right, it's not a big deal, but if you're a turtle and it's night time and you're trying to find somewhere to nest and you're tired and you just want to go back to the sea, it is kind of important. So, other threats that we have as well, once again, they're basically they're man-made threats, and that is um, people still unfortunately want to take turtles and actually eat them. So this comes about through poaching and also through bycatch. Those are the two supply chains whereby you will actually find turtles in markets. Now, in the particular instance of the picture you're looking at there, what happened was that was actually confiscated from the lady who was selling it. One of our guys went over, explained to her what the situation was. She was having none of it. He went off, brought one of the local policemen down, and that was game over. So she was sent home with her aluminium bucket. The stuff was confiscated, and she was basically warned that if she's ever found with sea turtle meat again, that she will be arrested. So the next thing we can look at as well is the kind of the different roles that sea turtle play. We've got seven different species of sea turtle, and each sea turtle has its own role. So the overall type of role sea turtles will play is that they kind of keep healthy seagrass beds, which is particularly relevant to green sea turtles and that also means that they're unfortunately the high level victims of impactions and plastic ingestion. Another thing they do is they maintain coral reefs and in maintaining the coral reefs they keep the reef alive and they also create safe areas where like small fish can actually hide from the bigger fish that want to eat them. So that is where we're talking about like, they provide key habitat for other marine life. Also by keeping the seagrass beds clean it provides a place where fish can actually spawn. They balance marine food webs. What do I mean by that? 
Well, if we take, say, the leatherback turtle, which, as Elizabeth pointed out, is like the biggest turtle. When we take leather, and also the heaviest, up to 2,000 pounds. They, what they eat is they eat the jellyfish. So we have the Pac-Man syndrome of them going all around the ocean, picking off as many jellyfish as they can. Jellyfish are 98% water, so sea, tur sea turtles, especially the leatherbacks, eat an awful lot of jellyfish to keep going. Now, where do jellyfish matter regarding that? Jellyfish prey on fish larvae. So too many jellyfish, too little fish larvae, too few fish. So we need leatherbacks also, just the way we need hawksbills, green turtles, loggerheads, all the species of turtle, so we can actually keep our oceans healthy and keep things in balance. So another thing that they do, they're one of the very, 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 they're probably the only species that actually provides a land-ocean connection, because while male turtles leave the beach once they're born, female turtles will actually come back and they will nest on the exact same beach on which they were born. When they come back and they dig their nests, the nests actually provide a lot of nutrients, which can actually help the vegetation on the beach. Why do we want vegetation? Because when you've got vegetation on the beach, it stabilizes the beach and it slows down erosion. So even though they live in the sea most of the time, they sneak ashore at night sometimes, they lay their eggs, that's future turtles, but they're also doing a little bit of gardening on the beach. So like turtles do lots of really good things. Now, one of the things that has happened to sea turtles, and it's unfortunately has happened to an awful lot of other species as well, is that we're finding ourselves in a situation whereby populations have declined massively, effectively since the 1960s, 1970s. So we're now like heading towards 2020. Populations have been in decline for 40 plus years, but we're at the stage where we need to start turning things around. Why we need to start turning things around is because if we don't turn things, the oceans are going to suffer more. If the oceans end up suffering, we as humans end up suffering because seven out of 10 breaths that we get come from the ocean. Over one billion people rely directly on the ocean for their own protein needs in the form of seafood. So it's in our best interest that we look after the oceans. Now, there are a few crazy people in the world. Here's three of them in front of you. Okay, so what happened was that we went down to Ghana on foot of a call that we got from Neil, who as you're probably guessing is the head that's sticking out in the middle. You know, I'm obviously not Neil because I'm here and Joanna doesn't look at the least like Neil. So Neil was actually working as a project manager on a project down in Greece where I volunteered in 2008. And Neil and myself got on really, really well. Neil already had over a decade of experience in working with sea turtles. And you know, he's probably forgotten more about turtles than most people will ever know. So he was the ideal person to teach me a lot of things that I didn't know about how much trouble the marine environment was in at the time. Neil and myself kept in contact with each other, basically developed a fairly strong friendship. He got a call to go down to Ghana to try and get a fledgling project up and running. He was on the phone to me, and then two weeks later, Joanna and myself were down there. So it was all very, very intense at the beginning. We decided it was actually so intense that we needed a night away. So we went to a place called Green Turtle Lodge, and that's where that photograph was taken. <laughs> so that's the three crazies at Green Turtle Lodge. First time ever out of Europe, down in Africa, kind of going, whoa, this is different. <laughs> okay? So what did we go there to do? We went there so that we could actually conserve the existing turtles, and then restore populations as well over the longer term. How are we going to achieve that? There's a number of different ways. One of the ways is dealing with fishermen, because fishermen are the guys who are going to have the most interaction with sea turtles. I can walk up and down the beach. I can do six hours on the beach in a night. Basically, I can walk the legs off myself. I may or may not see a sea turtle. If you're a fisherman and you're in the Gulf of Guinea, it's not going to take you too long to come across a sea turtle. So. What could potentially be our worst enemy, we've had to work on to turn around to be the best resource. Thankfully, we've got an awful lot of very good support from fishermen. They've understood where we're coming from. We're not trying to change their entire life for them. We're just trying to make their life easier and give the sea turtles a chance at the same time. We also need to look at where we were a couple of minutes ago there regarding where you saw the turtle meat in the market. We want to try and stop poaching, which is one thing that we can do by walking the legs off ourselves on the beach. Poachers, by their nature, are quite opportunistic. They're not looking for confrontational situations. So us being on the beach is basically enough that kind of, OK, I'm going to go and take the... Oh, I'm not going to take the nest. The guys are out. OK, leave it. So as a double safeguard measure, when we actually find the turtle, we wait until the turtle has gone back into the ocean. And nine out of ten times, for a variety of reasons, we'll actually remove the eggs from the original nest and we'll replicate that somewhere else. I'm going to show you now in a minute. All action starts with education. If we don't educate local communities, 
They have no idea why we're doing what we're doing, so the message ends up being completely lost. Ditto, if we don't actually engage all the people that need to be involved, then longer term, we're actually creating more problems for ourselves and the local communities that we're going to solve. So we need to take kind of a holistic, all-inclusive approach when it comes to conservation, if we want to be successful. So some of the things that we've been doing, where we were talking about there removing the eggs, is we'll actually make purpose-built uh, hatcheries. So these hatcheries are moved well up from the high tide line, which stops any risk of nests getting flooded. We also then, by having that, we protect the nests from cows, dogs, and potential poachers. So it's a very simple, very effective way of protecting hatchlings while they're in the incubation stage. For our anti-poaching, we normally try to recruit village youth who will, instead of going out looking for turtles to try and poach, or nests to poach, will actually work with us for a small amount of money, which is more than they would get if they were out trying to opportunistically poach or take eggs. You can see there on the right hand side, there's actually myself and one of the guys by the name of Enoch. So when we find a nesting turtle, we take various data on the turtle and we tag the turtle. I'll explain why we tag turtles in a few minutes and ditto why we take the details and about the turtle. When we know it's nesting, we know it's female, but we still need to know things like size, this particular species it is, these sort of pieces of information, which can all be very useful in determining more and gaining more knowledge about the species. So that picture was taken, I think it was summer ballpark about half past four in the morning. So turtles don't do human social stuff. You know, we kind of, we're working on turtle time, not on human time. So regarding anti-poaching, what we see on the left-hand side of the screen up there is the actual the new team that we took on. So these are four guys in wearing kind of Wild Seas t-shirts, what we do with all our staff, and what it gives them kind of a sense of pride in their work and also gives them a little bit of status in their own community is that we make sure that they all have Wild Seas clothing so they feel like they're actually involved and they're really part of the program and making a difference because they are. So this guys that you see here, those four guys, were actually the first guys that we've employed in the central region. So while our work was primarily in the western region, in the central region just east of Takaradi where we saw a while ago, that is where these guys are employed and they work seasonally to protect the turtles during the nesting season from September to December. But the guy who has his hand like this, his name is Elvis, he's not a singer, and um, he works all year round basically spreading the conservation message through visiting schools and also by taking slots on local radio stations and reinforcing the Leo, you don't kill turtles, it's bad for the environment plus it's illegal. On the right hand side up there you can see Isaac and he's actually releasing hatcheries from two very colourful buckets. What we would have done is we would have actually put the hatchlings into those buckets from the hatchery and we would have brought them down closer to the shoreline. If we release hatchlings too far from the shoreline, they're exhausted when they get to the water. If we release them too close to the shoreline, then a thing called magnetite, which is like its turtle GPS stroke compass, doesn't actually get to turn on in their head, so the sea turtle gets lost. So if any of you ever have the opportunity to see a hatchling on a beach, don't ever take it and put it straight into the water. Instead, let it go to the water by itself and just monitor it and make sure it gets in. That's the biggest favor you can do for a turtle. The other thing that they need to do is because they've been 30, maybe 40 centimeters underground, they need a bit of time to get some strength into the muscles. If anybody here has ever stayed in bed for two weeks, you know what it's like when you get out of bed and you try to walk, you've got jelly legs. So when the turtles actually come up from the nest, they've got jelly flippers. They need to build the strength in these flippers because otherwise they're just going to flop around in the ocean and not really do very well. When they leave from the beach, they have approximately three days of solid swimming that they do before they even start trying to feed. Now, when we have our belly buttons, they have a little yolk sac and all the protein and nutrients they need to see them through the first three days they already have on board. So once we don't put them straight to the water, once we don't kind of push them too hard, they know what they're doing. They've been doing it for 150 million years. They've got to have something right. So continuing on here, this was actually a small turtle that had been captured by fishermen. And you can see that one of the guys here, this is Evans. Now we have two Evans, so we don't like going like Evans and Evans Evans. So we just go Evans and Tall Evans, because Tall Evans is like really basketball player tall. So you can see here that regular Evans, we'll just stick with Evans. Evans um, 
is actually in the process of putting a tag onto a sea turtle. This will be explained to you, as I said, a little bit later on, why we tag the sea turtles. He's got a sheet here that you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, and that's a sheet that he'll fill in that'll have different data to we're just doing a turtle release. That contains more information because we also have to note down nesting parameters. Next thing we need to move on to and talk about is the fishermen that we mentioned a couple of minutes ago. So best friend, worst enemy. As I say, we have thankfully got to a position of best friend. The guy that you see standing over the sharks here, this is one of the target fisheries. That guy's name is Eric. He's been with us since early 2012 and he's still with us. He's one of the key members of the team. And basically, there are a couple of guys I'm going to introduce to another guy in a minute. But there are two real, real drivers. This, as I say, this is Eric. The other guy is going to be Enoch. And without both of those guys, Wildsies wouldn't be where it is today. It's very easy for me to go down to Ghana, parachute in, parachute out, and everything is done. Which doesn't work that way. We need really reliable people on the ground. And these two guys, of all, like, all the staff are good, but these two guys are exceptionally good. So as I say, you can see Eric there at the moment in his shorts and his polo shirt. And he's standing with a mixture primarily of blue and hammerhead sharks. That's one of the key fisheries down there that is normally conducted using long lines. The second fishery and the one that we get the most sea turtle interaction from is a drift and gill net fishery that targets more or less like small yellowfin tuna. Very, very popular down there. Still, I won't say plentiful, but reasonably attainable. In a matter of two, three days of fishing, they can get their boat full. You can see the size of the boats there as well in the background of that picture. These are all wooden handcrafted boats with basically screw down outboard motors. They're not big commercial vessels. The guys fill the hold and they sleep on the top overnight. So being a fisherman working in those waters in an artisanal fleet is not an easy job. So one thing that we have to we kind of really respect them for it is that they're doing really tough work to provide for themselves, for their families and food for the communities. So for us to go in and expect them to change all their ways just to suit our agenda of trying to save sea turtles is totally unreasonable. So we take a longer term approach with them and that is part of that is to do with education. Obviously, we're trying to engage all these guys. So what you're looking at here on the left hand side is where we're signing a memorandum of understanding or an MOU with one of the chief fishermen. And we've educated, we've told all the fishing fleet why we want to protect the sea turtles, why it's good for them that we protect the sea turtles. And then in advance of the nesting season, we'll normally try to provide some form of incentive that is effectively safety based, whether it's a strobe light, whether it's all weather gear, whether it's first aid kits, but basically something that's going to make their lives a little bit easier when they're out on the high seas for three days at a time, trying to actually fill the boat with fish that they can bring back ashore and sell in the community and use for themselves. On the right hand side there, you're actually seeing an MCAF supported project where we actually took a town of beach sane fishers and some canoe fishermen and we brought them on board on what we call our safe release program, where like, they commit that if they find turtles, they'll call our local coordinator. The coordinator will take all the details and ensure that the turtles are actually released back to the sea unharmed. <coughs> now we're going to talk a little bit about our tag and release program and why we actually do it. From the fishermen's perspective, what they see is that we're just basically taking the turtles and we're re-releasing them back to the ocean. What we try to make very clear to the fishermen is that they're really citizen scientists because by giving us those turtles, it's giving us an opportunity to capture valuable data, to tag the turtles, to get all that information put into a worldwide database. And over time, we can learn much more about species, size classes, sex ratios, and basically the movement of the sea turtles through this tagging program. So when we're involving the fishermen and releasing the turtles, they're helping us gain an awful lot more knowledge about sea turtles. You can see there on the left hand side that you have Eric and Isaac releasing a sea turtle. And on the right hand side, we have one more turtle that's actually had been caught and brought in by the fishers. I spoke to the people you see in that picture there. I explained to them what the turtles do. And whereas previously that would have been viewed as, you know, we're going to keep the turtle. The turtle was actually released back to the sea 
And once the people knew what the turtle could do in the ocean, they were actually quite supportive of our efforts. Sometimes it can be a little more difficult, as you can see here with Neil. So Neil is walking down the beach with a junior juvenile green sea turtle that had been captured in a beach stained fishnet. So as you can see, the little metal things on the flippers there, those are the tags that actually all have unique numbers. Each tag has a unique identifier on it. So they're walking away because if you look further down into the picture, you can see there's actually still fishing activity going on. So we don't want the turtle being released and getting caught in the same net a second time. So the only thing to do is just move well, well away from where that happened and that's what he's doing. And he's accompanied there by the guy in the white shirt who is Enoch, who's one of the other key members of the Wild Seas team. So that, needs to say, was perfectly successful. There were no problems there. Now, we've also been collaborating recently with some local resorts. One resort in particular, Ancobra Beach, has been getting a lot of volunteers from Germany down and they're working locally on recycling projects. But when they've become aware of the fact that there's sea turtles in the area as well, they're really on board with seeing what they could do to try and help sea turtles. You can see here that Eric, once again, is actually explaining about a juvenile green turtle, which is actually slightly younger than the one of the picture where we saw Neil. This turtle here would be maybe 12, 14 years old. The one that you're seeing Eric explaining is about eight, nine years old. We can tell roughly by the size, but we can never tell the age of a turtle exactly until after the turtle has passed away. Because just like a tree, if you actually take a cross section of the turtle's bone, it's got the rings, and that will tell us how many years the turtle has lived for. But it's not something we do when a turtle is alive. They wouldn't appreciate it. It's just really not a nice thing to do. Um, <laughs> on the right-hand side over here, you can see what for us was actually the first ever sub-adult leatherback that has come in. Now, we were yesterday, speaking, two days ago, sorry, speaking with somebody from Woods Hole, and they said basically... Leatherbacks of this size class are as rare as like hen's teeth. You just don't get them. So this has become a point of interest and we're going to try and follow up further. Next time I'm back in Ghana, I'm actually going to interview the fisherman who brought this in and find out as much information as we can because this can open a new window and give us all a lot more information. We're going to go backwards a little bit, back to the future as they say, and look at this guy now. So we saw this earlier on. Did many people figure out what was actually there? Show of hands of people who figured out what was there. Okay. Yeah, so a few, a few. Okay, what was the number? Anybody want to take a guess at the number? Uh-huh. Two. Yep, precisely. So now I'm going to introduce you to the turtles. On the left we have Bill, on the right we have Ben. Okay. These are the same two turtles that were caught in that net you've seen just a second ago. Enoch was brought... The, he wasn't brought the turtles themselves, but he was brought down to the beach where these turtles actually stranded in the net. He released them from the net over the course of the afternoon, kept them, checked that they were okay, that there was no problems with the turtles, they weren't dehydrated, they had no physical injuries. The turtles were okay. He tagged the turtles and then he released them in darkness, which is the safest time because nobody's going to come along and get them then. And it's also the time there's not an awful lot of nearshore predatory activity from fish. So it's quite a good time to actually release turtles back. On the right hand side, what you're actually seeing is one of those same two turtles, precisely 21 days later, who was found in another piece of net. Yeah, 30 kilometers south of where the turtle had actually been released in the first place. Now, that is, you can call it either the luckiest or the unluckiest turtle, I don't know. You know, you decide that one for yourselves. But you'll notice on the flipper, there's a very small abrasion there. Now that's already, that was already in the process of healing. It was actually an English guy who was out in a boat. I think he was working with the Coast Guard or something at the time. And he'd seen the net, but he'd seen movement within the net, gone over to investigate and found this little turtle. So this turtle was one of the two that you see Enoch holding there. And the only way that we were able to know that that was the same turtle was precisely because of the fact that we were running the tagging program. Without a tagging program, that would have been just another green turtle and we'd have known absolutely nothing. So what did it teach us? Well, it taught us that within that 21 days, the turtle had basically traveled 30 kilometers offshore. And importantly, that it had found itself caught in another piece of ghost net. Now, for us, that should be a message. Like, how does one turtle get caught in two pieces of ghost nets? I presume most people know what ghost nets are. Effectively, it's discarded fishing gear. Normally, if a fishing boat gets some gear snagged on a rock or something, or can't get it back, the only solution is actually just to cut it away. 
When they cut it away, it takes the tension off. That net will actually just float away and continue killing for an awful long time. So anytime we ever find ghost net, the first thing that we do is we actually take it from the ocean so that it can't do any more harm. The data that we took goes into a, simple, a very simple database that we've devised. Basically, it spells out what the species is, where it was caught, male or female, the size, the approximate age, and where we've watched tags we've put on each flipper. So we would like to have, say, maybe 771 and 772. We normally tag both flippers for the very simple reason that it's not uncommon for a turtle to lose one flipper. So if we only tag one flipper, it's not quite a 50-50 chance, but we're guessing, okay, well, let's hope the turtle doesn't lose that. Let's hope it doesn't lose either flipper, but let's particularly hope it doesn't lose the flipper with the tag. So we tag both flippers as a precautionary measure. From the program and from the data that we've collected, we do have the data up to 2017, but only up until September of 2017. I actually need to go and collect the rest of it because there's just far too much stuff for the guys to be sending me. So from the data that we have, which we've rounded off from 2014 to when we started this program to 2016, we can see species breakdown. Now, it's not surprising because worldwide, the olive ridley is the most common sea turtle. So as I say, nothing surprising about the fact that the majority of our releases are olive ridleys. That's followed on by green turtles, which are the ones you've seen a few pictures of there, quite a number of juveniles. This year, from kind of early 2017, we've noticed that there's been an increase in that, especially among juveniles. So if we were to look at this, that it was 2014 to 2017, we'd see that the green was actually going to be a slightly bigger slice of the pie. Leatherbacks, you see an asterisk there beside leatherback. The reason that asterisk is there is because the leatherbacks, because they can be so, so big, they can actually capsize these canoes. So what we haven't counted here is the ones that fishermen have cut free from the nets at sea. This is purely counting leatherbacks that have actually been brought ashore where we've taken the measurements. Loggerhead sea turtles are the second rarest sea turtles that we find in Ghana. The rarest are hawksbills. We're still waiting to actually have a confirmed sighting of a hawksbill. We've had a couple of loggerheads caught by fishermen and for the first time in over 15 years, last year we actually got a nesting loggerhead. So that's kind of really positive from our perspective. It means that they haven't gone. They're still around, there mightn't be many, but where there's a few, there's a chance we can get the populations back. So anything that comes in like that is big news for us. The other thing that we need to look at as well is like, what are we getting in terms of males and in terms of females? Well, once again, because the fishermen aren't out in the deep ocean where a lot of male sea turtles are going to be, we're going to find the majority of what we're catching are actually females. As I say, not a major, major surprise. And another area where this is going to become more prevalent, whether near shore or well, well offshore, will be, as we're experiencing rising temperatures globally at the moment, the sex determination of a sea turtle is determined by the actual temperature in the nest. If the nest is above 26, 27 Celsius, that's ballpark, I think it's 80, or 80 Fahrenheit, roughly. If it's above 80 Fahrenheit, we're going to find we're going to get a lot more female sea turtles. Below 80, we're going to get an awful lot more male sea turtles. So what we need to do as conservationists, trying to protect future populations, we need to make sure that that doesn't skew, that we end up with like 99% females, 1% males, and like, you can imagine that's gonna look in a nightclub, it's just not gonna be good. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody can be a wallflower. <laughs> Other sort of work that we do as well, because we need to take, as I say, a holistic approach and kind of cover things from all angles, while we're working with the fishermen who have the most interaction at the top, we also have to work from the opposite side. So we work with school children quite a lot. We do a number of education programs there. At this stage, like we've covered pretty much all the local schools. Some of the schools are really, really receptive to us. Other schools, not so much so, because they just, they've got their own stuff going on. And this does really mean a massive amount. We've got one school, which is Dr. Beamish School, which is in Axiom Town. And they're like super pro, come as often as you can, come once a week if you want to. You know, they're just really, really welcoming. There's nothing in it for them. We're taking away from their teaching time. We're trying to teach the kids about their local environment, why it's so important and why they should protect it. They're going to grow up there. 99% of those children will probably spend their entire lives in that town, maybe apart from like the odd holiday here and there. 
So if they're going to be in that town, it's in their best interest that they look after it. The earlier they start looking after it, the easier it's going to be for them. Along with just teaching the kids about what's going on, we want to try and get them involved, we want to get them thinking, so we will run art competitions. Initially, our art competitions, all of the entries, they were either, as you see there, on paper, or they were clay models of sea turtles. Now, when you get your first entry and it's a clay model of a sea turtle, you go, that's really cool. When you get to your 122nd and it's still a clay model of a sea turtle, it's kind of, yeah, okay, right. You know, we need to start changing this. This is getting a little bit same, same. I don't know, I think maybe somebody made a mould and then all the kids just came along with a bit of wet clay into the mould, okay, next please. So it was a production line of competition, you know, clay sea turtles. So we then created a caveat whereby, unfortunately don't have pictures for this, but in the Dr. Beamish school was where we piloted this, that if you were going to enter this competition, you'd have a week to do so, but you're not allowed to draw on paper, you're not allowed to make a clay sea turtle, because we've now at this stage seen hundreds of them. Clay turtles get really boring after the few hundreds. But you're going to go down to the beach, and whatever you're going to find on the beach that you can use to show how we can protect the environment, that's going to be your material for the art competition. Don't bring out creativity in kids. They're not going to go very far. Get kids thinking. Get them understanding that, like, yeah, I have a brain. I can use it. There's lots of things that I can do. Kids can be really, really creative. Some kids came back with boats that they'd made from bits that they'd found down on the beach. Other kid, another kid came back with like a dumpster truck that he'd made from all bits and pieces that he'd found on the beach. Another kid came back with like a boom box for the microphone when you're so if you want to play music off your telephone. This was exaggerating that. So like get them thinking, set their imaginations free. They're capable of lots. So we need to think as well that a lot of us, while we are making our changes, it's going to be future generations that are going to have the ultimate impact. The kids that we see here are going to be living there in 20 years time. They're going to be either the doers or the losers. We want to teach them to be the doers while they're where they're at the moment. It's very important. We get them understanding what's going on and why it's so important that they protect their own environment because it's their futures really. So you'll see now where one of the guys is actually speaking to a load of children after one of the clay sea turtle, sorry, art competitions, <laughs> and um, just basically educating the kids. You might think to yourself, okay, that floor looks a little bit unusual. The reason that floor looks a little bit unusual is because a really cool Spanish guy by the name of Pepe decided 15 years ago that he was going to go and find like a really, really remote part of Ghana, return to nature, and build a Spanish tapas bar. <laughs> okay, so like, you fly into Accra, which is the capital of Ghana, you drive seven, eight hours west, and bingo, out of nowhere, you've got a Spanish tapas bar. You know, not really a Dunkin' Donuts, but certainly a lot of different, you know, down there. Working also, we need to involve the state and the authorities. Once again, this was an MCAF-supported workshop, so we're very thankful for that, where we were able to bring together people from the Wildlife Division, from the Marine Police, Ramsar site managers, and also the Coast Guard and regular police. Getting people together, getting a bit of brainstorming going can create a lot more enthusiasm for kind of revising efforts and pushing things forward in sea turtle conservation. So, as I was saying, we need to bring all the parties that are involved to the table, and that's the way that we're going to have the most successful conservation program in the long term. Nobody wants to be in and out, you know, one hit wonders, and then we're all gone. We don't want that. We want a long term program that's going to be sustainable and it's going to protect both the people and the sea turtles around the region. Another area of our work, we're going to hark back now to something we mentioned earlier on, which was about sea turtles ingesting plastic. I'm going to introduce you to Billy, the sea turtle. You can see Billy there, first of all, sitting on a chair being examined by Joanna, and then secondly, in the bucket, receiving IV fluids. Billy had ingested a lot of plastic because as a juvenile green sea turtle, Billy would have been eating sea grass, so he'd have been eating off the ocean floor. But it's very hard for a turtle who hasn't been to school or involved themselves in art competitions to understand the difference between seagrass and a little piece of plastic. There may possibly be green or it may be a bag. So Billy had a rather long rehabilitation. Billy was very weak coming in at the beginning. Billy was so weak that the head has to be supported so that Billy wouldn't actually drown because the neck couldn't actually hold the weight of the head even though the turtle could float. 
So you can see there, there's a little water bag under the head, and that was supporting the turtle. On the right-hand side, once again, you can see Enoch, and you can see George, and George is actually getting ready to give the turtle a very small amount of multivitamins to help the turtle in its recovery process. So we all know what goes in must come out. This is a pretty good example, if it's a slightly graphic one, of the goes in comes out equation. So what goes in is a plastic bag. What comes out at the far end is still a plastic bag, but just not really the same consistency. Um, to get all of this plastic out of Billy took almost seven months. So you kind of think to yourself, a turtle has managed to retain plastic for seven months. That's because we couldn't operate. We had to feed the turtle. First of all, we had to stabilize it. We had to run numerous courses of antibiotics. Enoch had to be trained in how to do all of this for when I wouldn't be there. And himself and his wife totally rose to the occasion, put their hearts and soul into it. And earlier in the same year, Enoch had actually had another green sea turtle in a similar position that hadn't survived. And he had very, he had actually considered quitting his job because he felt he'd failed the turtle, but he hadn't. Without training, how would he know what to do? He'd done the very best that he could. That's all that can ever be expected of anybody. So luckily, Billy's story had a happy ending and we're going to wave bye-bye to Billy. You can see there's Billy on the ground, ready to go. Okay, it's not a turtle race, it's just Billy. So Billy was able to take Billy's time. And as you can see, it was kind of like a leisurely descent back into the ocean, back home and plastic free. So we hope now Billy hasn't got back on the plastic diet. You know, but that's like one of the little success stories that makes all the hard work really, really worthwhile. You know, is it going to be hard? Yeah, of course it's going to be hard. Nobody said it was going to be easy. So like we faced numerous challenges along the way. One of the challenges when we're working to do this and then we come across like a turtle that's been butchered, it's very demotivating. So we can't let it take our morale down. We need to keep motivated. And one of my jobs is to actually keep the staff motivated. Make them realise, yeah, you're going to have really bad days. You're going to have days you're just going to say, I don't want to do this anymore. Get back up on the horse. Go and continue doing it because you're making a difference. So the staff need to know that what they're doing is really making a difference. Other problems. We need to create long-term change in how people see turtles themselves. See sea turtles. Um, we need to get the support of all the communities that we're working within and try and get them to spread the message to other communities as well. We still have the problem of opportunistic poachers. Because fish, fish catches generally have been falling, the people who would have relied on fisheries are now turning as well to poaching turtles. Because these guys need to eat or they need to bring money in. It's one or the other. So whether they're poaching the turtle to sell it or whether they're poaching it for direct consumption, we need to try and eliminate that completely. If necessary, it may mean putting in place alternative livelihood systems whereby maybe another member of the family, while they mightn't be fishing, will be guaranteed that through some alternative income programme, they can bring in money, which will reduce and eliminate the requirement or the excuse for anybody to go poaching. So as I say, falling fish, fish catches have been a fairly major problem, and that's increased poaching. But we've been working on that. It's a slow burner. It's just going to take time to get it all correct. Another challenge that we had, which is kind of slightly more unorthodox challenge, is the challenge of the missing toilets. So we had one staff member who was helping us. We were going to build a volunteer centre. We changed the direction of the programme. We decided then we weren't actually going to go through volunteer programmes because they were causing us basically more hassle than they were actually helping us. We were kind of two thirds of the way through this process, but we hadn't yet built the bathrooms. So this particular wise guy decided it would be a great idea. Okay, John's not around. John's back in Ireland doing something there. Yeah, I'm going to nick the toilets. I'm going to sell them. So back in 2013, three toilets went missing. Despite extensive searches by the local police, the toilets were never found. We believe they went to the Ivory Coast, but it's unsubstantiated. So these are some of the problems that we faced. You know. Now, in all the problems that we faced, we've also had lots of good achievements along the way. We've secured, at this stage, the release of over 1,000 turtles through our fishermen programmes. We've protected thousands of hatchlings and less eggs from poachers and also like dogs and people who walk their cows on the beach perfectly normal, nothing odd about that. We've gained support of the Wildlife Division and all the local enforcement authorities like the local police, the Coast Guard. We were the first organisation to actually run a tagging programme. I believe we still are the only organisation in the Western region 
running a tagging program, but there are other efforts going on throughout the country where other people are actually running tagging efforts as well. But in the Western region, we still remain the only ones doing that. Our schools education program has reached well over 1,500, probably like two, two and a half thousand school children at this stage, plus their educators. So they're getting that message out and about, which is really, really cool. And we form partnerships with other, internet, with other sea turtle organizations internationally where we can share best practice. So how have we done all this? Well, it's kind of like been blood, sweat and tears from the core, like Neil, Joanna and myself, but none of that could have been achieved without help from, in particular, the Marine Conservation Action Fund of the Aquarium. So they've supported us a lot of the way through for the last few years on the work that we've been doing. And that support has been really important from a point of view, it actually motivates the guys. It makes them see that like their work is gaining worldwide exposure. They're not just doing a small thing in a small town, but they're doing a really big and important job in a big world. So from that support, we're able to get a lot of extra enthusiasm and we're also able to get a lot more fishermen coming on board. So I'd like to just give a particular thanks at the moment to the Aquarium for all the support that they've given us. Where are we going to go from here? Well, we need to first of all look at everything that we've got, we've got to keep. Then we want to try and expand. We want to make sure that where we're trying to change the attitudes, we are actually changing attitudes. Where we're going to see that is in people voluntarily saying, okay, we want to release this turtle, letting us know, not wanting anything for it. In the local market, a sea turtle can fetch anywhere between 100 and 300 gan a sedi. If you divide that by four, that'll give you your dollar rate. We don't want people selling turtles. We want people releasing turtles. Attitudinal change comes at a generational speed. It doesn't come like instantly. It doesn't come after one visit. It takes a generation for this change to come through. Now, we're already beginning to see some of that happening from the children that we would have met in the very early days coming and asking us, what can we do to help the sea turtles? Can you give us some work? We really want to do something here. We understand what you're doing, we're a bit older and we think we feel that we can help. So this is where we're talking about making like the turtle conservation integral in these coastal communities. Not something that's odd, not something that's different, not something that some guy from Ireland has come down and gone on about, but something that's just, it's every bit as normal as the way we get up in the morning, we brush our teeth. It's not something that's thought about, it's just, it's automatic. So we're here this evening, we're in a very interconnected world. You might think to yourself, you know, it's not an awful lot that I can do. Don't think that. Because everything is interconnected, there's a lot that we can all do. So I'm just going to put a few very simple pointers up there for you now. You can have a quick glance at those. Most of you probably are quite aware of them already, but sometimes it's good for all of us just to remind ourselves that simple things can make a difference. Okay, the power of one. It's very important. Especially if you meet one of these and they're female. Okay, I think most of you can probably guess that's a mosquito. Mosquitoes are not our friends. In their saliva, they carry a parasitic protozoa that we would normally just call simply malaria. You know, being there, done that. These girls, I don't ever want to meet again. Okay, so like, that's really, really small. That's one, but it's got an awful lot of power. The same is true of people. Like, there's 7.6 billion of us here at the moment. Not in the room, that would have been a tight squeeze. But basically, there's all over the planet. There's 7.6 billion people. Neil went down to Ghana. He decided he was going to make one phone call to me. Joanna and myself went down. Because of that, we've now got over 1,000 turtles saved. We've done all the education programs. We've got communities involved. And we've made a really, really big change. So something as simple as one phone call can instigate big change. I think that's something that we need to be very mindful of because we can get lost in a sea of like desperation. We get these bad news, drama, media stories all the time. Oh, the planet's collapsing. Oh, all the ice is gone. But if we start subscribing to that, we become powerless, which is something that we can't do. We have to remain, remember that each of us has the power. Like that little mosquito girl back there, she had an awful lot of power. Each of us has power. So we should never let ourselves be disarmed by certain negativity that we come across, rise above it, keep going. That's the most important thing for us to do as people. That's how we're going to provide a better planet for future generations and for ourselves today. 
So, I hope you've enjoyed all of that. I don't hear any snoring sounds, that's reasonably good. So, just like, as I say, thank you all once again for coming out. I know it's not a great night. Hopefully, there's not going to be like biblical rains when we all go outside later on. But I'm going to put you back to Elizabeth for a minute. And then, if anybody's got any questions, please shoot them. So, back to Elizabeth. Thanks, everyone. So, you said that sea turtles, their sex is dependent upon the temperature. And you also said that you kind of help some of the hatchlings and everything and bring them to a secluded area. Have you ever tried cooling the temperatures of those to kind of correct the imbalanced sex ratio, or do you find that that's, um, you know, immoral? Okay, yeah, no, it's a very, very valid question. The question was regarding the actual, the sex determination and how can we avoid ending up with like far too many females, not enough males and really bad times in the nightclubs. So thanks for the question. Um, there was also the point raised about like, is it immoral? to actually try and skew things. Well, if you're a sea turtle and your species is, is boring on the brink of extinction, you're not gonna worry about like what people do to try and help save you. So we have no ethical issue regarding like shading nests to actually keep temperatures down, to try and ensure that we have enough males as well. Because if there ain't enough males, there's not gonna be enough mating opportunities. That's gonna put populations further into decline. Now, I've worked with organizations that are already doing shading and it's something we're actually going to be introducing this year so from september of this year once we're actually into our nesting season we will actually be introducing shading on a limited number of nests so thanks for the question go ahead can you go back to the slide on how we can help change behavior sure <laughs> <laughs> oh, mosquito yes my friend yes. Yeah, yeah. all right some somebody else oh way in the back there yes First of all, thank you for your work in Ghana. My friend here and I are from Ghana. Oh, wow. super. It's uh, very important to see someone like you who has invested your time to go there to protect our natural resources because uh, most of the time you don't often see it from government policies. I guess the question that I have is have you had an opportunity to present? your funding and your work to any of the uh, ministries in Ghana, and if so, what has the response been? Well, first of all, thanks for, the question is like, where have we gone regarding our work and working with ministries within Ghana? Um, thanks for acknowledging the fact there's not a huge amount of us down there working, you know, but like we kind of view like sea turtles are, they're an integral part of Ghana's marine heritage. They were there long before any of us people were around. So they've always been there. We have a duty of care to them. We've collected quite an amount of data over the years. We haven't, to answer your question directly, we haven't actually presented to any of the ministries. However, we have presented to uh, Nana Kofi Adunisha, who is the head of the, he's the chief executive of the Wildlife Division of the Forestry Commission. We have to know the president and, oh. uh, and the Super. We could do a talking. <laughs> Meet up in the lobby. He'll be in the lobby very shortly. <laughs> Super. Yeah, I look forward to talking in a few minutes. Okay, that's right. Power one. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Anything except, except this one. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay. Way in the back. Yes. Um, you were mentioning about the magnetite in the wooden turtles scrabbling to the Okay, very good question there about where I was going back to where I mentioned about magnetite earlier on in a sea turtle and the whole idea of a sea turtle going back to the beach where it was born. So to answer your question, the magnetite effectively turns on while the turtle is on the way to the sea. What that does is it creates a thing called geo-imprinting, which lets the turtle know where it is. And that's how they actually find the beach that they were born on, once again, when they reach sexual maturity, which in an olive ridley can be 15 years, in a green turtle it can take around about 30 years. The maturity is pretty much directly related to the expected lifespan of the turtle. Normally comes in around about 25% of their expected lifespan. 
So with a green turtle, they can live up to 120, 130 years. So they reach maturity around about 30 years. After that 30 years, that magnetite in their head that will actually have guided them around the oceans will actually get them back to the same beach that they were born on. And studies have shown that what's known as like nesting fidelity, how close you come to precisely where you came from, is normally within two to three hundred meters. You know, so like it's not kind of like I was born in Dublin in Ireland and I went back to like West Cork, which is like miles and miles away. You know, or like I was born in upstate New York, you know, but yeah, I went back home to Nest, you know, I went to California. You know, it's not like that. This we're talking like two, three hundred meters. You know, so like it's really, really accurate. And that magnetite, it works with the north and south poles of the planet, creates this magnetic field. And that's why, as we were saying, we don't put them back into the ocean straight away when they're hatchlings, because we really need this to turn on so they can geo imprint. And if they're females, actually get back to where they want to be when they want to lay their nests. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, um, I, I know your program benefits financially from the, from the fund. And you've come here for the week and you've talked to children and um, aquarium staff and whatnot. Are there any um, lessons that you'll take back from your week here and your experiences here in this fellowship? The biggest thing I'll take back from it is that after I had to run in with that particular little winged lady last year, I was kind of, I won't say I was on the verge of giving up, but I had got a lot more deflated with the whole thing. Coming here for this week has kind of given me that kickstart that I needed. And it's also, it's great because there's an awful lot of stuff that I can take away that I can tell the guys. The efforts that are going on, what the aquarium is doing, not just for sea turtles, but like for lots of other species of marine life, like the right whale project. Like there's so much going on at the aquarium. And for myself and for the guys, sometimes we can lose sight of all the good stuff that's actually happening. So coming here has kind of exposed me to a lot more of the good stuff that's going on around the world. And as I say, it's kind of kickstarted me back into action. One last question. So as the sea turtles continue to grow, if you have them tagged at a younger age, is there a specific design of the tag that you use so that when they're growing older and growing larger that it doesn't restrict them in any sort of way? What we do when we actually put the tag on is we just pretend this is the tag here, okay? So we don't actually put the tag fully onto the turtle. We put it like halfway on, normally leaving about a centimeter, a bit over a centimeter, so that the flipper can continue to grow. Now, those metal tags that we're looking at, they work on a very, very simple clip mechanism. They normally would last four or five years. What will happen is as the turtle grows, effectively, we know the way like that when the tree is planted, its roots move really, really slowly, but it can actually eventually break concrete. It can put a crack in a wall. It's the same with the sea turtle flippers. Over time, their slow growth will actually loosen off the tag itself and the tag will fall off. So we normally get maybe three to five years out of a tag. So meaning that the, tag, the turtles that we tagged at the beginning back in 2014 have another year or two to go. We could theoretically get one of those exact same early tagged turtles back again, but the tag at this stage will have fallen off. Good question though. Um, I know that you said that turtles can sometimes be at risk due to fishing efforts collapsing. Um, do you know if in the area or other local areas, um, any aquaculture efforts, so just like bivalves specifically, have been implemented to try to take fishing pressures off? Locally, where we are now at the moment, there's nothing like that on the go. The only thing was the question regarding, like, because of the fishing pressures, what's been doing to actually get rid of the fishing pressures? And the suggestion was maybe like bivalves, mollusks, that type of thing, uh, that would actually work in an aquaculture situation locally. Probably would work. I don't see any reason why it wouldn't. But what we would need is we'd need somebody who would have the capital to actually want to invest in something like that with a local partner. So it's kind of, it's outside our particular area of what we do. But I do know that there are some people and they're actually farming tilapia fish down there. So that's providing a steady source, but it's not on a scale that you're suggesting that would be able to actually reduce fisheries pressure overall. You know, very good idea, but it would need some like major international partner. You know, effectively, if you had a, like a seafood producer, stroke manufacturer who had a bit of forward vision, that's actually a really good idea. You know, so maybe one will step out of the woodwork someday. That's all. Maybe we'll do one more question, and then we're gonna have cookies and lemonade in the uh, lobby here. I'm and we're all gonna get a sugar rush. That's right. <laughs> exactly, Emily. 
was there one moment when you first started this? Because you said it was it was such a big change from what you were doing beforehand. Was there one like moment or story that you you realized that like you moved here, you'd moved your whole life, and then okay, I think this is gonna work. Like, was there a first turtle you saved or, or something like that? The, the make or break, break moment. Yeah. Uh, it was actually taking a fully grown green sea turtle. It all sounds very dramatic, you know, so <laughs> I don't want to kind of over -dramatize, thing, dramatize things. But basically the fishermen had caught a fully grown green turtle. I was alerted to this by a guy Went down the beach, this was like five o'clock in the morning, John's still like half asleep. So going down the beach, walking into the jaws of death. <laughs> Got there, was told like, you have to give us like 200 centi, you know, or we're not going to release this turtle. So I basically stood over the turtle, that's not going to happen guys. Shouting, roaring, arguing. Now that's, you know, you don't mind people shouting, it's, that's okay. But when somebody's shouting at you and they're holding a machete, that puts kind of a slightly different angle on things. Eventually, we got back, got things nice and calm. I gave them, I think it was 40 SETI, and I got the turtle released, a long way off the 200 SETI they were looking for. Got the turtle released, walked away, went back, because I really, really needed sleep at this stage, and I was Mr. Jelly Legs. It was kind of like... I'm lucky to be alive after that. You know? <laughs> I should be like really, really badly injured on this beach, you know, with fishermen running away. But that didn't happen. And that was one of those kind of, yeah, I can do this moments. I suppose if, that was, if there was a defining moment, that would have been it.